so I search. going to continue on a series that we began on last week. It's called The Watchman, and uh, we're dealing with a very important topic that uh, is important to uh, our success and our strength as uh, people of God. And uh, once again, thank you so much uh, for those that are with us for the first time. We'd love to connect with you afterwards. When you came into the auditorium, you received a worship guide. I invite you to take that out and as you take that out, that will allow us to be able to engage with you. My notes can be your notes, and uh, we don't always hit every single point. We always endeavor to be led by the Holy Spirit, but uh, certainly if we don't, you can go online and pull that down, be able to look at it and engage with it later, all right? However, we have a lot of, I think, good things to cover today. Um, today is uh, not only, I would say, maybe inspirational, but I believe this will be educational and training. So uh, if you love the idea of getting sharpened and trained and equipped and, uh, and a lot of good things you can take home and dig into later, well, this particular message is especially for you. There are scriptures that we'll unfold and dig into. Others I will have for you to reference. Otherwise, we'd be here for hours and hours. But here's what we need to understand. And here's our subtopic today. And that is how to pray with authority and skill. How to pray with authority and skill. And, you know, some, uh, unfortunately, in many cases... Uh, prayer is uh, sort of seen as uh, something we just throw up some words and sometimes throw up enough words and hope something sticks. <laughs> but how many know if you uh, had to have a surgeon work on your body, work on your knee, work on your elbow, and he says, well, you know, I, I don't really work with skill, but I just kind of throw up some things and pull some instruments out and just kind of hope I make something happen. How many know you would not sit under his or her knife? No, no, you want someone who's going to be operating with authority. Is that right? In other words, they know what they're doing and they know why they're doing what they're doing. And you also want someone who is operating with skill. Well, I believe that uh, one of the ABCs of our development, your development, my development as a follower of Jesus Christ is to learn how to pray with authority and with skill. So that's what we're going to look into today. And right at the top of your notes there are some fill-ins for you to engage with me. And I just want to summarize what prayer is really all about. And, and I mean, we could give 100 points. You can go online and maybe see 25 points. But, you know, depending on the message, the Lord will have me boil them down to several points. Last week, I actually mentioned one of these. And I said, very simply, prayer is connecting with God. All right. And so we're going to look at three things that prayer is. Now, why are we bringing these three points? Because we're learning how to pray with what? Authority and come on. Skill. Come on, we're learning how to pray with what? Authority and skill. So when, if you're going to do something with authority and with skill, that means you have to have some understanding. So today is about developing understanding. Now for some of you, I know uh, that uh, probably uh, most of the scriptures, uh, maybe all of them, will not be the first time you've heard them will not be the first time you've uh, heard teaching on that particular topic. But like I always say, man, if we'll just come ready and open with an open heart and an open mind, and I mean a hungry spirit, man, I tell you what, God will fill your hunger. He'll show you something you hadn't seen before. You, he'll answer something you didn't even know you had a question to. I mean, I, I remember coming up spiritually where oh, we grew up. Actually, my wife and I, same church. You know, uh, Bishop Butler would tell certain stories from time to time. Uh, it would fit, you know, in what he was teaching. And he'd share some testimony. And I may have heard that story 5, 10, 15, 60 times over the years. 60 times probably. But every time he would say it, I'd be right on the edge of my seat. 
And I'd be listening to it as if it was the first time. And every time it would inspire, every time it would deposit faith and grace into my heart again. So I encourage you, if you hear something, you've heard it before. If you heard it last night, hear it again today. Come on. All right. So here's what prayer is. Prayer boils down to these three things. We need to get this and understand when I am praying, I am doing these three things. Number one is your first right in connecting with God. That's what we said last week. But here's an example. We didn't look at this. Luke chapter 6 and uh, verse number 12. Luke 6, 12 says this. One day soon afterwards, Jesus went up to a mountain to pray and he prayed to God all night. So what was Jesus doing? He went apart. and You can see this all throughout the Gospels. He would go and get alone with God and he would connect with God. So when we are praying, we are connecting with God. But here's the second thing that we need to understand about prayer. Number two, when we are praying, we are confronting the enemy. These all start with C's, you know, they just it helps rhyme better, <laughs> sticks better. Number one, connecting with God. Number two, confronting the enemy. I mean, no, we have an enemy. All right, it's about 60% of you. Let me try it again. Maybe the mic went out. How I many know you have an enemy? All right. Now, if you're, if you're in the body of Christ, you've crossed the line of faith. You know that. If you haven't, let me introduce to you the understanding that the Bible says that there is an enemy that we have that resists God's will in our life. He goes by many different names, and we'll see one of them here. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says this, it says, be sober, New King James, and be vigilant. The word sober means calm. It means calm, cool, and collected. Amen. Literally, it means that. And then it, and, 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 and within the word sober, uh, I, I, I like to study words that Holy Spirit helps me to get understanding. It's, it had this, had this little word in here. Listen to this, dispassionate. Now, dispassion. So I so I investigated that. The Holy Spirit already showed me where he wanted what he wanted me at least to see about that, because dispassionate means non uh, even emotion. In other words, not heightened in your emotions one way or another, which tells us that one of the ways that the enemy tries to get you derailed is by manipulating your emotions. So the Holy Spirit had Peter to say, be sober, be calm, cool. Don't let anything rattle your emotions. Be sober, be vigilant, be watchful, be attentive. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. All right. So be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil. I just want to pull that phrase out. Your adversary, the devil. Now, the word adversary, it means to oppose, to be against. It's a, it comes from a Greek word. And that's not important. I'm not that I'm, I don't have any intention to be impressive in Greek because I'm not impressive in Greek. But there's a point in that that I'd like to pull out for instruction. It's made up of two words. And part of that word that comes that we have adversary, the first part of that word is anti, A-N-T-I. Now, we know right away as English speaking people where that's going, don't we? Because anti means what? Against or to oppose. The second part of that word is very interesting. It means the word judgment or decision. So now when you put those two together, it seems kind of interesting. He is opposing a decision that has been made. Well, whose decision is the devil opposing? He is opposing the decision that God has made about you. He is opposing the verdict, the determination, and the decision that God has made about you. Well, what judgment has God? See, judgment is not always negative. Come on, if, the plan, if you got a judgment for $100,000 to your good, I mean, no, you're not negative. Who knows you're smiling out of the courtroom all the way to the bank? Come on, talk to me, somebody. No, judgment doesn't mean anything negative necessarily. So God has made judgments about you. God has said you're his son. God has said you're his daughter. God has said I, you belong to me and I belong to you. God has said you are blessed. God has said Holy Spirit is, lives in you. You're one with me. You are healed. You are anointed. You're blessed. You're an heir of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus. You're loved. You're redeemed. That's what God is, says. You're the seed of Abraham. You're blessed whether you feel like it or not. 
He has made judgments and determinations about you. And what the adversary does is he, now the next part of that word, the advers your adversary who? The devil. Come on, your adversary who? The devil. the devil. Now, devil is not just another handle for Satan. In other words, it's not just another name for Satan. We call him that and that is a name for him. But devil actually is a description term. It actually reveals how Satan functions. The word devil literally means one who is uh, who slanders. He's a slanderer. And a slanderer is one who makes up accusations falsely against an individual in order to ruin their reputation. So now watch this. In that short phrase, Peter is revealing one of the one of the several ways in which the enemy will oppose your life. He will come and speak words against the judgment that God has made about you. He will try to get you to believe something other than who you are in Christ. Amen. And the word devil means he's a slanderer. He will lie about who you are. So that now how does how does he do that through life, through situations, watch this through circumstances, through mistakes, maybe even that have been made through misunderstanding, through transgressions, things that have happened to you, you that have happened to you, all kinds of things through life. He uses every situation he can to then slander you to find some way to bring down your identity as less than who God says you are, which is more than conquer and overcome. So if you're in the middle of a financial challenge, he is whispering to you, broke, loser, will never make it, always going to be this way. When God's judgment of you, son, heir, join heir with Jesus Christ. Huh? His, his word is, he who has given up his son, how shall he not give us all things? That's his judgment. But what the enemy does is try to get you to believe another judgment. And the number one target of his slander is not your neighbor. It's not people at your job. It's not your husband or wife. Come on, somebody. The number one target who he wants to believe the slander about you is you. Because if he can get you to believe lies about you, then he will neutralize you. So in that one verse, we see how the enemy comes at us majorly through thoughts and ideas and concepts. And I just know this one thing about me, you, and everybody in this room is that this thing right here is never quiet. Come on, the University of Minnesota years ago says that we think on average mostly unconsciously, about 80 to 90 percent is unconsciously, 4,000 thoughts a minute. Now you say, well, pastor, I don't remember six thoughts in the last minute. <laughs> I get that. I understand that. I understand that. And sometimes I, I can be with you depending on what we're focused on. But the point is, most of those thoughts are unconscious, which means you're unconsciously believing stuff and thinking stuff at a rate of 4,000 thoughts a minute. I mean, no, that's a lot of thoughts. And if we don't get a hold of God's truth, then, then we can be neutralized because we, we're, we can be ineffective and not winning, not gaining, not going up into the right on the chart of our lives because we're believing lies about us. You know, in basketball, uh, we used to, you know, it, when we would play, you know, sometimes if we felt that a guy couldn't handle the ball very well, and some of the guys and ladies who played too, you all know where I'm going. Now, it's five on five, right? How many? Five on five. But if we knew that a guy couldn't handle the ball, we wouldn't guard him. We would kind of double up on somebody else. They call that cheating. It's not cheating, but we'd say we cheat off of him because he's self-check. In other words, he's going to mess up himself. So there's no need to waste energy. Let's cheat off of him and double up someone who's a greater threat. Let's not be self-checked. 
to where our own thoughts and our own wrong belief about ourselves is keeping us from moving forward and going up and to the right in our lives. See, see, so, so when we are praying, we need to understand, yes, I'm connected with God, but there's a part of our praying that is also confronting the enemy because you and I have a real enemy. And then number three, when we are praying, we are conducting business, kingdom business. We are conducting kingdom business. So I want just, you know, no matter what category and, and throughout our time in this, this, under this series, we'll deal with different strategies of prayer, different techniques of prayer. We will deal with uh, um, levels of, uh, of um, other levels of, of prayer going deeper than the surface. But no matter what, we're always dealing with these things, connecting with God, confronting the enemy, and conducting kingdom business. Here's what Matthew chapter 16, verse 19 says, and we looked at it last week. He says, I will give you the what? Come on, who remembers the keys last week? Come on, did, it, did some of you remember that? Hope, bring your keys out again. Come on, this is good. Bring them out, bring them out, bring them out. Bring your keys out. Shake your keys. What are these? Je these are keys. Jesus says, I have given you the what? Keys of the kingdom. Not a key, keys. And he didn't say, I'm holding the keys. He said, I'm giving them to you. Keys unlock and lock stuff. That's what they do, right? So the only reason Jesus would tell us that he's giving us keys is he's telling you and I, I'm giving you the power to lock and unlock stuff. I'm not keeping it myself. You're my agent. You're my representative. You take the keys. Amen. And, I, and I've given you these keys to, to, to unlock. Whatever you bind, this is the Amplified, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already bound in heaven. Wow. So it was already bound in heaven, but it was waiting on me to bind it before something actually happened? Yep. Because we got the keys. Not Jesus. I remember reading about, and I heard about it recently somewhere again, but there was a, a minister that would come to our church one time, a general we would call him the faith, and you know, one of the streams of the body of Christ. Uh, he's in heaven, now his name is Kenneth Hagin. And he had many amazing experiences with the Lord, several of which he was caught up to heaven. Now some people don't believe in that, but... That's between them and the Lord. But I do. I believe the scripture teaches it and so forth. Another other message. But anyway, he had an encounter with the Lord. And in one of these encounters, he was standing before Jesus and Jesus was teaching him about the authority that the sons and daughters of God are to walk in and have been made available as New Testament believers. And he was teaching him about these things. And he's standing there listening to the Lord. And all of a sudden, while he's listening... Uh, this little creature looked like a little weird looking monkey, it was ugly, had weird ears and shape and sound, and it was about this tiny. Jesus and Brother Hagin were standing across from each other, and while Jesus is talking, this little monkey-like creature got right between the two of them and just started saying, yakety, 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 yak, yakety, 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 and Jesus is talking, and Brother Hagin can't hear him. And he's going yakety, 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 he's jumping. And finally, Brother Hagin just had enough of it. He said, Jesus, uh, don't you hear this creature saying this? Aren't you going to do anything about it? Jesus says, I can't. I gave you authority. And as soon as he got that, he told that thing to shut up and leave, and it shut up and it left. And then he could hear Jesus talking. Now, again, he's teaching him. Nothing that is outside of Scripture. You see? Because even encounters have to be backed up by the Word of God. And really what he was saying is teaching him through that illustration and part of that encounter is I've given you authority. If you don't bind the devil, this is what Jesus went on to say in the book that I was reading, The, the Believer's Authority. He said, if you don't bind the devil, I can't. Because you have authority. Come on, elbow your neighbor and say, you have authority. Praise God. You have authority. Yes, you do. Now, all right, now. 
So, so because of that, we need to understand uh, these things. Now, God, uh, well, let me just say this about kingdom business uh, in, in, in Matthew 16. Kingdom business, that means we're doing things on his behalf. Prayer is, among the other two definitions, it's the process of transferring resources from that realm into this realm. That's, I mean, I, that's, bone, that's not in your notes, but that's also what prayer is. Part of it, that, that falls under the last one, conducting kingdom business, because see, he's at the right hand. He left us here. And prayer is how we conduct business on his behalf. We access resources. Well, what kind of resources? Well, peace, power, strength, wisdom, right? Connection with his provision by faith. All of those things that we need in life to go further in life, to help people be free in their personal life, to help people understand their purpose, all right? Uh, insight, revelation about our own lives and about the lives of those that are around us that God wants us to encourage. All of those are resources. And when we are praying, we are bringing those resources from that realm into this realm to help people. All right, now. Because of that, we need to appreciate this. God doesn't want our prayers to just be shotgun prayers. A shotgun, shotgun shoots shots and they go in a sort of a wide uh, uh, a range of, of impact. God wants our shots to be in prayer more like a laser or rifle. In other words, accurate. Single point, very intentional and very targeted, right? And that's what God wants us to be. How many know if when you don't understand the purpose of a thing, the tendency is to misuse it? Or watch this, or sometimes underuse it, or if not, abuse it, right? When we don't know why something is and how something works, we tend to misuse it, underuse it, or abuse it. I, you know, I'm a guy, and I just have a confession to make, that when it comes to electronics and things like that, I just tell you, right, I just tell you the truth. Confession's good for the soul. That's not in the Bible, but it's a pretty good truism. <laughs> and that is this. I just admit it. Maybe two, three other guys are like that in here with me. The more buttons it has, the more I want it. Amen. Right? I mean, it, the more buttons it has, the better it is to me. Now, now, never mind if I'm going to use the buttons or if I even understand the buttons, but the more buttons it has, the more impressed I am with the thing. Amen. But I found a lot of things in my life that I've purchased with a whole bunch of buttons. I didn't even use half of the buttons. Right? Because I didn't understand the purpose of it. And therefore, I underuse what was available to me. You see, if we don't understand what prayer is, we will underuse it. We will underuse the privilege that we have. Prayer is a privilege. Prayer is not a religious drudgery that we have to do in order to be okay with God. Prayer is this beautiful, amazing access that we have, first of all, to connect with God. And then, then also, we, it is an authority that we've been given to confront the enemy and anything that is resisting our lives. What an access, what a privilege it is. What a weapon that we have in prayer. All right? And then, of course, it is, it is how we conduct business for the kingdom of God. And, and so prayer is not meant to be drudgery. It is meant to be a good and wonderful and exciting and energizing thing in our lives. In fact, I believe uh, we could explain it these ways. God would want our prayer, and this is how God intends for our prayer lives to be. And I've, I've given several of them here. Number one, he intended for them to be intentional. Intentional. That is, in other words, we do this on purpose because we have understanding. Intentional. So Paul said this in Colossians 1, 4, I'm reading through these script. We won't study these deeply, but you can see them and study them later. Colossians 1, 4 says, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all people. I think I want the verse before that, verse number three. Let me see if I can go to verse three real quick. I think I intended for you to see verse three. 
Colossians 1, 3. It is something that we do intentionally and all the time. See, here it is right there. Come on, let's read it together. Ready, read. We what? Always pray for you. See, that's intentional. We always pray for you and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you do something always, you're being intentional. All right? So it's intentional. Then number two, it, God, God intended for prayer to be effectual. Effectual. When something is effectual, that means it produces results. He intended for it to be effectual. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has what? Come on, power, and it produces wonderful results. Prayer of a righteous person has power and it produces wonderful results. So wonderful results are on the other side of our prayers. Watch this. And the unprayers of the righteous, the not prayers of the righteous, the lack of praying of the righteous produces no wonderful results. Produces nothing wonderful. But how many know we want some wonderful results in our lives? He's just telling us that prayer is effective. Uh, if someone would do me a favor, if you could grab that power on the side, I want to plug this tablet in and keep my power here, all right? Maybe we can find a way to plug that in. I'm okay how it looks this morning. It's right on the side there. They'll get it. Thank you so much. All right? So prayer is intentional, and prayer should be what? Effectual, all right? James 5, 16 says this. And then here's, here's another thing why it's so important for us to be connected with others. Right? Because that, that, that verse says, the effectual prayer of the righteous avail much. But he says, pray who? One for another. That you may be what? Healed. All right? All right. So watch this. Everybody, just look at me right quick. Just pretend Minister Corey is not there. It's one of those distractions the enemy tries to do to get us to miss something. Don't even worry about it. They'll find something, find a long extension if you need to and bring it from here. I don't care how you guys do it. Go ahead and do it. But you guys just hear me, okay? We good? All right, listen. Now, now, here's what he says. Pray one for another. That's why we need to be connected with one another. Now, we're, we're developing again, coming into a season again, where we'll bring small groups and there'll be opportunities for us to connect throughout the fall and, and then and into a semester, into the new year. It is so important. You know, they did a study that said one big draw horse can pull 8,000 pounds. That's, pretty, that's a lot of weight, isn't it? And then two horses we would expect to, could pull how much? 16. That's not what they found. You see, one could pull eight, but two together will pull 24. Why? Because what they're teaching us is that there's power and unity and synergy. And that when two are together, they can actually do more work than they could do individually pulling the same thing. And then here's, here's what we found this even further. That if the two horses train together, in other words, watch this, if they were in relationship, they couldn't pull 24, they could pull 32,000 pounds. So the two horses together could pull four times what they could pull individually. Thank you, gentlemen. Because why? Because there's the power of unity and the power of oneness. And that's why it's so important for us to be connected together. See, when you're connected with others, not only does it help you to walk in healing and freedom, but it also accelerates your learning and pushes you faster when you're in the company of good people who are going God's way as well. Amen? So prayer is to be intentional, effectual. Number three, it is to also be uh, transformational. Transformational. Luke 22, 31, it says this, 31 and 32. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you. Why? So that your faith should not fail. 
So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Prayer is to be transformational. It is to be the place where change and transformation takes place. Because Jesus, listen, we are not Christians to simply, to simply be saved by God. Hear me now, we are Christians to be transformed by God. So salvation is the first step. Transformation is the goal. Remember from our last series on the fruitful life, we're not saved just to believe in him, but to be changed by him and to become like him. Right? So how do we become like him? Part of that happens through prayer. It's where we're changed. Come on, Jesus was all night in prayer. There's no wonder why when they called him everything but the son of God, he didn't go off on someone and hit him upside of the head. You know why he didn't? Because he remained focused on who he was. He never allowed what they said about him to sink down on the inside of him. He was transformed by God's presence in prayer. Prayer transforms us. Here's the next one. Prayer should be revelational. Revelation. What does that mean? It should add and open up the eyes of our understanding. God intended for prayer to be revelational. In other words, I can see him and understand him more. I understand who he is more because of prayer. Yeah, I, I, I know him better. I see him more clearly. Watch this. I see me more clearly. It's revelational. It opened up my eyes. I can see better now. I understand my own purpose more clearly. Not only that, it can, it can be revelational. I may be able to see the treasures that's in you. Okay, okay. Be why? Why? Because I've been in God's presence. How did Jesus know that Satan was trying to sift Peter? Because he'd been in God's presence. Because he was with God, he could see what the enemy was trying to do in his friend. Why? It's revelational. So here, here's, what, here's what the prophet said. It's like 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. Listen to this. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. Oh, wait a minute. If you go back and read the story, what the man saw with his physical eyes was the armies of Syria surrounding them, trying to assassinate his, his uh, leader, kill both of them. Well, the man's eyes physically were working perfectly fine. That's what scared him in the first place. So what did Elisha mean when he said, open his eyes? Oh, he wasn't talking about these, friend. He's talking about the eyes of his heart. You see, there are things that if we get in prayer, it'll become revelational to us. We'll see things that our eyes and senses and intellect and brain power and reading power could never reveal to us. It will open up the eyes of our heart to see and know the resources or the things that the God wants us to know and see. And what will it produce? Peace. In many cases, it'll produce faith. It'll make you bold because you actually know what's going on. See, a lot, see, when we can see more clearly, how I many you know you're a whole lot bolder? I mean, I mean, you know, if, if your team is playing in a championship or a playoff or something like that, and you want to see the game, usually you try not to hear or see anything until you get home so you can experience it yourself. But I mean, if you heard... Man, it was a tight game. Man, that thing went into triple overtime. Oh, my goodness, man. But your team won. How many know you're going to watch that game a whole lot more comfortably? And it doesn't matter if your team is down by 56 points with two minutes to go. It wouldn't matter because if you already know the results, you're going to sit back and relax. Matter of fact, you're going to get some popcorn and you're going to get your refreshments and you're going to enjoy watching how your team comes back and wins in spite of the circumstances. When you know something in advance, it changes your entire posture. God never meant for us to live through life nervous and worried and anxious about stuff. Get in the prayer closet and let him open your eyes so that you have revelation of what's going on. 
And you don't have to live in fear. Get a revelation by getting in the closet with God and let him open your eyes. That's why I like. And here's the deep thing about it, because I've studied this for years and years. It doesn't even say that Elisha saw the chariots and the horses. Let's read the rest of the verse. I didn't read verse 17. It says, and the Lord opened his eyes. And what did he see? And around him were what? There were there were uh, around the hillside. He saw uh, horses and chariots. So the man's eyes enabled him to see what was going on in the spirit realm. It didn't even say that Elisha saw the horses and chariots. He just said, open his eyes so he can see it. See, sometimes when you've been walking with God long enough, you get to the place where you don't even need to see it because you know it on the inside. But I need him to see it because he's, 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 he's freaking out right now. So Lord, open the, open the boy's eyes. Open his eyes. Boom. He saw it. How many know everything changed? All right. So I just want us to see that transformational, revelational, effectual, intentional, and lastly, joyful. Joyful. God intended for prayer to be joyful. To change us, transform us, be revelational, be intentional. We do it on intention because we understand. The principles, we understand what we're doing. We're conducting business. We're binding the enemy or we're connecting with God, right? It's effectual. It makes things happen. Come on. And it's joyful. Psalm 1611 says this, for you will show me the path of life. David said, in your presence, that's prayer, is the what? Come on. Fullness of joy. And at your right hand, our pleasures forevermore. Praise God. That's prayer. Prayer, God's intention is that our prayer lives would be like this. That, 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 like, that, that and on a regular basis, out of prayer, we would experience ongoing revelations of who he is. Seeing him more clearly understanding him, knowing him more personally, building confidence and greater sense of security because we see and know him better, right? Uh, clarity in our, in our own lives and, 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 and all of these things, and then joy. Now, that's what God intended for it to be. So in order for prayer to be all of those things, then we're going to have to know how to pray with authority. We're going to have to know how to pray with authority and with skill. And the ABCs, okay, or if we said praying with authority and skill 101, it would be praying God's word. In other words, how to use the scriptures themselves to pray God's word. So what we're going to look at are some examples just for a few minutes here of how to take God's word. There are actually prayers that the Holy Spirit himself wrote in the Bible that are designed or that are there for our benefit to take and then pray and use intentionally in prayer to God. And when we use those prayers that the Holy Spirit wrote intentionally, they will be effectual. They will bring revelation and be revelational. They, they will also bring joy. They will be also transformational. How many know that if the Holy Spirit wrote a prayer, it's probably pretty good? Amen. Scale of one to ten, it's right up there at the top if the Holy Spirit wrote it. Well, what do you mean, Pastor Tom, the Holy Spirit wrote these prayers? Uh, isn't this prayer, uh, aren't we going to read names like Peter and Paul or John or, or David or Solomon or people like that? I thought they wrote it. Well... <clears> that God helps us to understand how the, the Bible came to be without getting into a long conversation. But 2 Timothy 3 uh, says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, verse 16 and 17, and is profitable for us for doctrine or teaching, for reproof, getting corrected, adjusted, instructions in righteousness, doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction so that we can be fruitful and, and productive and ready for every good work, basically, right? So the Holy Spirit breathed, used human instruments, people, men, 
to, to, to scribe his heart and mind. These their times, their cultures, and everything else. But what we have today is God's heart, God's word to us that he has preserved. So the scriptures that we're going to be reading are scriptures that really, literally, they are prayers. Most of them, as we're going to see, will sound like this. I pray this, that, and the other. And it's the Holy Spirit using the authors to basically say, if I was in your shoes, this is what I would pray. That's what we're going to see. So we're going to look at these prayers. We're going to look at the categories that they are directed toward, right? Because we're learning how to pray with what? Authority and with what? Come on, and we're not going to pray shotgun prayers. We're going to pray how? Laser prayers, right? So therefore... We're going to be intentional, and we're going to let the Word of God tell us what to say. Because a lot of times people aren't confident in what to pray because they don't know what to say. Well, the ABCs of becoming stronger in prayer is go right to the book itself and let it tell you what to pray. And since the Holy Spirit wrote it, then if you're praying what he wrote to the Father, he definitely, you're definitely praying his will. And if you're praying his will, you know he's hearing it. And he says, if we know he hears us, we know God is moving and we have the petitions that we're praying. So I want you to have confidence that you can pray and God hears you. It is every Christian's right to be bold and confident in prayer. There is no good reason on earth why not one, not why any Christian should not have the confidence to pray God's word. You don't have to be deep. You don't have to have gone to Bible school. You don't have to have a degree in, in the Bible. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be any of those things. You can take God's word and pray his word right to him out of his word with your eyes open. God will hear you and he will hear you and it will be powerful. So I want to walk you through these things and I want to hit some areas that will that deal with all of our lives in very personal ways. Right. And this is and I believe this will be very helpful and powerful for us. All right. So first of all, your next note there talks about Ephesians 6, 17. And I want to pull that out before we look at uh, the different types of uh, scriptures and the prayers that are here. Ephesians 6, 17, the New Living Translation. Uh, let's read it together as they have it there on the screen. Ready, read. Put on salvation as your helmet and take what? Of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. So now notice the Word of God is called the what? Sword of the Spirit. Uh, the Amplified says it this way, the sword which the Spirit wields or uses is the Word of God. And that tells us then that the Word of God is a sword in the spirit realm. So that means, now how many know you don't, that it, now the sword, and it was a certain types of sword, and that was actually like a very long knife, really designed for hand on close combat. But the point is, how many know the sword wasn't for peeling potatoes? Come on. It was for combat. In other words, it was for warfare. So what does that tell us? It tells us if you have to have a sword in the spirit, that means you're in warfare. Right now, we need to be always highly conscious of who Jesus is. Come on. Who we are in him. How great is our God like we sung together. How, how he loves us. Come on. How he has angels in camp round about us. All of his promises. We need to be very, very, very conscious of that. And, but we also need to be aware that we are in warfare. Because if you don't know you're in warfare <laughs> and your enemy does, um, you're in bad shape. Because I mean, like, if, if you don't know that you're in warfare and he does and he's warring against you, you already lost. You lost before you, your feet hit the floor. Because you don't even know you're in warfare. That means he's taking your lunch. He's taking your relational lunch. He's taking your marriage lunch. He's taking your financial lunch. He's taking your health lunch. He's taking your lunch in some area of your life. 
He's taken your lunch in terms of your potential and calling and assignment and reason that you're on the planet. But it's time for you to stop letting the enemy take your lunch. Come on. Elbow your neighbor and say, hey, take your lunch back. Yeah, take your lunch back. All right? So watch this. A sword, here's your next right in, is an instrument of authority. It's a weapon, but it's an instrument of authority. In fact, this is is not in your notes, but it's a reference. You can read it later. It's in Romans chapter 13, around verses 1 through 7. And Paul is writing to uh, Christians who are living in a very uh, uh, unfriendly world. It is very unfriendly toward Christians. It is mostly pagan, meaning uh, anti-God or pro the worship of all kinds of other stuff other than Jesus. That's the world most Christians were living in. And it was very aggressive and very outwardly antagonistic against being a Christian in that time. Oh, we talk about some things we hear here and feel there and come across the airwaves and in our school systems. And there's some stuff that's bad, nasty and subtle. And some of it is more overt, but nothing like the stuff they were dealing with then. And here's what he was telling them. He said, in spite of all of that, you need to do the right thing and have a right attitude and and you you don't put yourself in position where you're going to be punished because you're not doing the right thing so he was saying even in a pagan unfriendly world system keep yourself doing the right things for the right reason because if you do the right things for the right reason even in a world that is against you God has ordained certain powers of government not for the sake of oppression, but for the sake of order. Now, of course, men and women, and I say men, I mean men and women, can be crazy and wild and all kind of stuff has been out of order from the Garden of Eden. However, what he's saying is that we need to be doing the right things for the right reasons so that we don't have to be afraid of punishment. And in those verses, what he was saying that He says, for those who bear the sword, bear not the sword in vain. Meaning, he said, they are the minister of God to execute judgment on evildoers. So what he was saying, don't be an evildoer and you won't have to worry about the sword. So what what we need to understand, though, about that is that sword represented the authority of the government. Now, you've been given the sword of the Spirit. You've been given keys. That means you and I have the authority of the government of God. It's the Word of God. So therefore, if I'm going to pray with authority, I must know how to pray the Word. Because the Word is the sword, and the sword represents the authority of the government. So if we can learn how to pray the word, we can learn how to pray with authority. And how many know that if you leave out of here and go to the intersection of Palm and 15th, and just as you're getting ready to turn left to maybe head towards wherever you're going, lo and behold, there's a police officer standing right there in the middle of the street. And it says all all the lights are off. And here you are coming up to the intersection and a police officer standing right in the street. And you've seen this a hundred times in your life or, or better where they stood up and did this to you. And what do you do in your five, four, three, four thousand, five thousand pound vehicle? What do you do? You stop, don't you? Why? Because the authority said stop. Now, that officer who is putting up their hand is operating by the authority of the government. Their posture says to you, do not go any further. Now watch this. Your car, how many know, weighs more than the police officer? And certainly if it's moving, it has more energy and all of that. And if, and, 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 and by sheer physical force, how many know you have more power than the police officer in that position? But the police officer in your car is not stopping your car because they have physical power. They're operating by the authority of the government. 
So when Jesus said to us in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, behold, I give you power over, watch this, over all of the power of the enemy, there were two different words there. The first power, he says, I'm giving you authority over all of the ability of the enemy. So the enemy may have ability, but you have authority. The car has the ability to overrun the officer. But the reason the car is not overrun the officer is because the person in the car respects the authority. If you don't know you have authority, the devil won't respect you. Remember, he is lawless by definition. He doesn't obey laws. So it doesn't matter that you're a son of God and a child of God and he shouldn't be doing this to me. If you don't stop him and resist steadfastly, he won't back up. So, therefore, the word, praying the word, helps us to pray with authority. Let's walk through these. Number one, here's the first one. These are prayers for wisdom. This is, this is a scripture to pray for wisdom and revelation or understanding of who Christ is. And we're going to look at this verse. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. I'll read down. It says, uh, verse 17, he says, Asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. And I also pray that you will be, uh, that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now, he's far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but in the one that's coming. God has put a few things under the authority of Christ. Huh? Oh, all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of who? So he's over everything for your benefit, not his. He's over it. Now, here's what Paul went on to say this. And the church is his body. It is made of com uh, complete by Christ who fills all things. Now, here's what that prayer is praying. It is literally asking for the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of your understanding so that we literally get a better understanding of who Jesus actually is. See, there's intellectual knowledge and then there's understanding with your hearts. And what this means is this doesn't happen automatically. You can be a Christian for 20, 30, 45 years and we can ne and never know really who God is beyond the surface. And this is a prayer that says, Lord, open my eyes and help me to see who you really are and help me to see the power that is in me, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. So that means it is God's will for you to literally understand the power that raised Jesus from the dead for your personal life and my personal life. And that's a prayer. Now, who, who should we pray this prayer for? Number one, ourselves. We ought to also ought to pray this for one another. You can pray this for other Christians. You should pray this for your pastors and your, and, and, and your pastoral team. You should pray this for any believer you know anywhere in the world. These are prayers to pray for one another and especially for yourself. So how would I pray this prayer? Listen to this message later. I would pray this and this is how I pray and this is how I pray for you all. I, I would pray it this way for me. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you will give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in who you are. Open the eyes of my heart that I can see even more clearly the hope that you've called me to and how much power there is in me 
and help me to understand the same power which raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling in me now. Help me to see, Father, that it's not going to come to me. It's already in me. Help me see what I already possess. Open the eyes of my heart. And how often can you pray this? All the time. Because you see, Paul said, I always pray that God would do this. Why? Because guess what? When it comes to knowing God, there's no limit. It keeps going. Once you know this level, there's another level. That's why it's all right to pray these ongoing. It keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. God says in the ages to come, he's still going to be showing us stuff. We will never, ever, ever stop knowing God. It will always be exciting. It will always be an adventure. It will always get greater. Thank you, Lord. All right, come on, let's walk through this next one. The next one, this is a prayer for the spiritual inner strength, a prayer for understanding the love of Christ. And this is a prayer for becoming filled with God's presence. Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 19. I begin reading, you can listen along. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything on heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. This is a prayer to be strong on the inside, right? Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all of God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. And he says, I'm praying that you may experience the love of Christ, though it is too great for, I would say, natural understanding. Then, then what? Then, when you experience the love of Christ, when you're rooted in love, what will happen? Then you will be made complete with all of the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Come on, somebody. Do you understand what this dude is asking God to do in us? To be filled with all of the fullness of who God actually is? And we, let's see again, God doesn't play games. He's not playing with us when he says this kind of stuff. So that means we can be vessels and people who are full of God. Because we owe the world an experience. So I said to the dream team this morning, listen, listen, do you realize today is the first day of the week? You do know that. See, some people look at this, my weekend. No, this is the beginning of the week. First things first. That's why, that's why it's good. It's good tradition to honor God at the beginning of the week. First things first. But I was saying to our dream team, listen, listen, if this is the first day of the week, that means people that come here, whether they're members here for years or whether they're here for the first time, this means that they are starting their week engaging with us. I mean, we might be outside of somebody's house, the first people they see at the beginning of the week. That means when they encounter us, we want to present God to them. The heart of God to them, God's heart, God's father, his arms that are reaching out to them and wanting to love people and wanting to embrace people and wanting to, 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 to heal people and see people free and, and, and be all that they can be. So let's love like that. Let's welcome like that. Come on, let's smile like that. Let's shake hands like that. Let's welcome people like that. Because what? That's God's heart for people. All right. So so we can be filled with his strength understanding his love and be filled with his presence. So I, you can pray. Who should we pray for? One another. Pray for yourself this way. Pray for a co-worker that way. You can pray for anyone that way, especially those who are born again. Now, there's application for the unsaved in these two, and we'll get to those. But here's what I want you to see. The next one is this. The next set of prayers for knowing God's will. 
for spiritual wisdom and insight, for living a life that pleases God, for knowing God more personally, for living with joy and gratitude. I'll read through Colossians 1.9. So we have not stopped praying for you since we heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. We pray that you will live, that you will live uh, always in honor, that you will live, that the way you live, rather, will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all of his glorious power so you will have all of the endurance and patience that you need. That you may be filled with what? Joy, always thanking the Father. He's enabled you to share in his inheritance who belongs that belongs to his people, verse 13, for he rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and he translated us or transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. He's literally praying that we would know his will, that we would have wisdom and understanding. Do you know that most times when people say, man, pastor, if I just knew God's will, or what do I need to do? How many, have been in, how many are in a situation right now? You need to know what to do. See, this is, th th then you can take God's word and pray it just like this. So this is how I pray it for myself. This is how I pray it for you. Or if I'm praying for a specific person, you could pray it just like right out of the Bible. Father, I take a moment right now and I ask that you will give so-and-so. Complete, you will give John complete knowledge of your will for him and give him spiritual wisdom and understanding. Father, I pray that he will always live a way that pleases and honors you live in such a way that does that. That his life will become very fruitful, that he will continue to grow and know you better and better. I pray that John will be strengthened with all of your glorious power so that he has all of the endurance and patience that he needs. And may you fill John with joy. May he always give you thanks because you have made him able to partake of your inheritance that belongs to him. I thank you, Father, that you have translated him out of the kingdom of darkness and you have transferred him into the kingdom of your dear son. And that he has forgiveness through you. Um, he has forgiveness through your blood and the forgiveness of sins. That's how you pray for someone right out of the word of God. And then let me read these two more, two more to you before we unhook. Now here's the next one. This is a prayer for growing in love and understanding. Growing in divine priority and living blameless. Now I don't know about you, but there's a lot of things that vie for my attention and are competing for my attention and my thought life. How about you? Watch what Paul says through this prayer. Philippians 1, 9 through 11. I'm going to read them. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep growing in knowledge and in understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. These are prayers that you can pray all the time for yourself or another. This is how you pray for your pastors. This is how you pray for those that are in authority, especially in spiritual authority. This is how you pray for members on your dream team. This is how you pray for your husband and wife. This is how you pray for your children. You pray this what? I, Father, I pray. That my wife, my husband, I pray that my children, my family, that their love will overflow more and more. They will continue to know you more clearly. Now watch this, that they will learn to sense what really matters in life. Because a lot of times we're spending energy on what doesn't matter most. But if we know what matters because we've been in prayer, then we can make decisions and learn how to let go of what doesn't matter so that we use our time well. All right. And then for those that are in authority, 
We've, we, many of us are familiar with this verse. It's 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Therefore I exhort that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for who? All who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, I left another verse. You can reference that later. But what that tells us this is that people that are in places of high responsibility and particularly in government, not of course in schools and other areas of society, but especially in government, they need wisdom that comes from above. See, there's scriptures that says, listen, men may sit in place of position, but God is really the ruler of all nations. And here's what's interesting. If Paul said that we need to pray for them, then apparently our prayers matter and determines and influences what happens or doesn't happen. All right. So in other words, we are not just to be here and just let everything happen. We'll be here to be salt and light, and we are here to conduct kingdom business through intercession and prayer. Now, there's other forms of intercession as we go throughout this. We'll get into how to pray at higher levels of prayer and more sophisticated forms of prayer and more powerful types of prayer. But we need to be praying for those that are in authority, right? so that we can be the force of light in our nation. Amen? That is so important, all right? Because no matter what, there will always be all the chatter of what goes on in our nation, good or bad, left or right, Democrat, Republican, Green Party, Red Party, Blue Party, Polka Dot Party. The end of the day, what it's about from the enemy's standpoint is division, divide and conquer. And I always tell people, if any conversation starts about anything political, starts with a D or a R or this policy or that policy, you already missed it as a Christian. You've already missed it by a million miles. The issue is, what does God say? Yes. Now, let's start from there and then look at things through the lens of Scripture. And then more than that, let's be people of prayer. Amen? All right. Now, and then lastly... For the unsaved. Now, I'm going to end with this here. Uh, those that have not come to Christ yet, there's only one reason. And that is that they just don't see it. We just don't see it. Come on, there was a time when I just didn't see it. I remember someone sharing their faith with me, and we would call it witnessing to me. In other words, they shared. I remember someone, there was a family member saying to me, you know, um, uh, the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I can remember, because I think I was about 10 years old when that happened, and I can remember where I was, and I can remember that person saying that to me. And let me just tell you, man, see, see it's not about how good a person you are or not. Being saved or unsaved is not about being good or not. It's about, it's about being dead or alive on the inside. It's not good or bad. It's dead or alive. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Let the, the pregnant pause is on purpose. He came to make dead people live. He didn't come to make... Watch this. This sounds provocative, but it's true. Trust me on it. You don't have to be a Christian to be good. No, you don't. 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 You don't have to be a Christian to be a good person. But whether or not we're right with God has nothing to do with me being good or not. Is am I alive or not? So at 10 years old, after hearing that simple message from John 3 16 they said it they said they were kind they weren't rude they weren't beating me over the head with the Bible come on somebody they were being very kind and do you and I can remember this because I the Lord I wanted me to remember it, and I couldn't just remember because it, it was in my heart my conscience even then but you know I remember on the inside rebelling against that at 10 years old now, if you ask me, in my mind, I was just, man, I was just as innocent and as good a kid as there ever was. Didn't matter, I was dead. 
which means he, for me, even at the age of 10, I had enough sense and accountability to actually kind of reject that. And in, my, and in my heart that was dark and not alive to Christ, I was like, oh, I don't want to hear that. Now, I didn't say that, but I remember feeling that. Isn't that something? So what, the, what was that responding like that to the gospel? My heart that was dead to God. And it was rebellious. And it didn't want him. Didn't want his lordship. What was that? But bruh, bruh, Pastor Tom, man, come on. Did you say you was a good kid? Yeah, I was a good kid. Straight A student that year. Straight A's. All ones in citizenship. Good kid. Good kid. What kind of kid? But dead inside. Ten years old. Heard that. <clears throat> I didn't want to hear that. That's what I felt. On the, I didn't say the words, but I felt it. Why? Because I had Satan's nature. Well, it wasn't about being a good kid. Oh, all, by all rights in society and all of my parents' friends, I was a fine, good young man. But as far as God was concerned, I was dead in sin. And I needed salvation. Wasn't about being good. It's about being dead. One day I heard, I went to a church service and the guy gave a, it was a movie about the end times. At the end of the day, it wasn't even really the movie that moved me. But at the end of that, it was a young youth pastor. Gave an invitation. And uh, man, in my heart, I just said, ooh, I'm not right with God. I felt we call it, in Christian talk, we call it conviction. I felt persuaded inside that, man, mm, I'm not right with God. I, ooh, I, need, ooh, I don't want to leave here. I, I got to get right with God. That's the best way to describe it. Best way to describe it. And I went and gave my heart, my heart to the Lord. See, the only reason I acted that way at 10, because I didn't see it. So when Jesus was talking to this woman at the well, and you can reference these later and study them later in John 14, 14, here's what he said. He says, woman, if you knew the gift God has for you, and if you knew who was talking to you right now, you would ask me, and I'd give you living water. The only reason she didn't ask, because she didn't know who she was talking to. Your friends, your family, your co-worker, the only reason, there's nothing wrong with them in one sense. It's just they don't see it. Because Satan has blinded their eyes. That's another scripture, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, if you want to write it. Their eyes are blind. So here's one scripture. I'm just giving you one today. Here's not John, in Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Let's read it. Notice what he says. Jesus says this. He said to the disciples, the harvest is what? Great, but the workers are few. So what should we do, Jesus? So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his field. That's just one way. Now we're going to get into some sophisticated high power, high octane forms of prayer for leaders, authorities, people, etc. But this is the basis, praying his word. So I would pray, Father, I ask you in Jesus' name, I know it is your will for John to be saved, for my boss to be saved, and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So I thank you that that's your will. I already know it. Now I bind the enemy who has been blinding his eyes from seeing. And in Jesus' name, Father, I agree with your word that you send labors into his path. Even use me if the situation uh, uh, presents itself to be one of your labors, to bring the truth to him and help his eyes to open, to see. I believe you that his eyes are open to see the gospel and Jesus become Lord of his life in your name. And from this day forward, Father, I will give you thanks and I will praise you that his eyes are open, and that he sees Jesus for who he really is. Amen. And that's how you pray. That's a basic way to pray. And then in many cases, you get out of the way. <laughs> Especially when they're close to you. You know what I mean by get out of the way? In other words, from that day forward, then treat them like they're already saved. 
Talk to them like they're already a brother in the Lord. Love them into the kingdom. Amen. Did you get anything out of the word today? All right. Let's bow our heads for a word of uh, prayer.